a, a webinar organized by Undercurrent News and Spheric Research on land-based salmon farming. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to approach this topic today with the, um, the uh, basically through the lens of COVID-19. Um, there, there's been in the salmon industry um, a huge movement towards land-based technology and um, not just by the traditional salmon farming companies growing larger smolt to improve their health performance at sea pen farms, but also to grow fish to harvest size. And today um, I'm joined by a really distinguished panel of um, protagonists in this industry. And um, I would just like to introduce everybody before we get started. Uh, just before um, I, get, I get go into that, um, I just would just like to give an, a, a sense of the format of today's webinar. So there'll be a very brief presentation by myself, which will just set up the conversation. And then most of this um, hour will be dedicated to Q and A. And I think everybody would like that as um, we've got some great speakers today. So I'm just going to um, go around the panel and get everybody to introduce themselves. Um, so how about if I start with you, um, Eleni? Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Eleni Kilasidi. I'm a researcher in Sintef in Norway, and uh, I'm working in aquaculture operations group, uh, having background on uh, cybernetics and use of automation and robotics in aquaculture. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Eleni. And I'm um, re really looking forward to what you have to say about automation with this, uh, with RAS technology. Um, okay, and how, uh, uh, Martin, um, you, you go next, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm Martin Fothergill. I'm a co-founder and partner of ATEF Asset Management, which is a global private equity company. Uh, we're focused on impact investing, but specifically land-based salmon farming. We set up in 2016. Uh, our headquarters are in Singapore, but I'm based out of the London office. Um, the reason I'm here today um, is because ATF created a company called Pure Salmon, which is a global land-based salmon farming and processing business. Um, and I guess it comes as no surprise that we really strongly believe that land-based is the key to solving the supply-demand imbalance in the salmon industry um, uh, to bring locally grown, sustainable, fresh salmon to customers all around the world. Great, thanks for that, Martin. And um, I'll move on to Brian. Uh, first, uh, thanks, Matt, for inviting me to uh, participate in the panel. Um, I'm hoping for a good discussion today. Uh, my name is Brian Vinci. I am the director of the Freshwater Institute uh, based in Shepherdstown, West Virginia in the USA. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, research and development group uh, that's been focusing on development of land-based uh, fish farming technologies for uh, 30 years now and in the last 10 years we've focused a bit on land-based salmon farming and going forward in our next five years uh, we're focusing on continuing that work with um, fish health welfare and performance research uh, both for salmon and for steelhead uh, we'll be evaluating some of the um, genetics that are available to the proponents in the industry, looking at identifying the best genetic strains uh, for these projects, um, as well as working on some uh, ways to reduce water use and also um, uh, increase the overall performance of fish in these systems. So uh, the program uh, is uh, very enthused by what's going on in today's, uh, today's industry and I uh, look forward to the discussion. Great, thanks very much. And finally, Roy. Thanks, Matt. Um, my name is Roy Hayos. I'm the CEO and founder of Lighthouse Finance. I'm based in Oslo, calling from Oslo today, and um, we have been working with uh, the aquaculture industry for many years, uh, specializing on financing and supporting uh, the industry. Uh, obviously, the topic today about land-based farming and uh, raw technology has been our view and uh, of that industry is, is obviously known for many that we, we believe in it. And uh, we have tried to support 
several cases uh, globally um, to start up or uh, to uh, develop their existing business. And hopefully today I can um, view, give some views of uh, what we think of uh, what has been good and what is going to be better in the future. Thanks, Roy. And um, yeah, it'd be really great to hear from you afterwards. I, I know you've been very closely involved with negotiations over the last few days, um, bringing Siemens into a major um, RAS project. So I'll ask you about that shortly. Um, so um, Mark, just for anybody who doesn't know, my name is uh, Matt Craze. Um, I work uh, very closely with Undercurrent News. I have my own consultancy called Spheric Research. Um, I, we, we do uh, industry reports and uh, exclusively with um, Undercurrent. Uh, my background really comes from the more of the finance industry. I worked for Bloomberg for many years and I set up their news products in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and then in Latin America. So I'm not gonna bore you too long. I'm gonna do a really brief presentation to um, just to set the the, um, the the you know to frame today's conversation, and I'm going to try and get it as quickly as possible to um, Q and A, and I'm sure everybody that's what everybody wants. So um, I'm just going to share my screen, and go to the start of my presentation. So one of the reasons why we, um, we we're particularly interested. Um, is not just because um, there is uh, a, a lot of investments and announcements going on right now, but it's also because we've actually just uh, published a, or, or are about to publish a database or a handbook uh, for the industry. And um, I just, um, <clears throat> just as a way of getting this started, um, this this data we will announce more about this in coming days, but. Um, we have a, a, a database of projects and um, we've identified more than 80 um, um, grow out projects, what I would call the, the, the uh, projects where you grow salmon to harvest weight. Uh, so most of these projects to date have been quite small um, when you compare them with sea pen farming. So a couple of these producers have got to production levels of about 1000 tons a year most of the projects going forward are much bigger and are planning facilities such as pure salmon that that are producing at least 10,000 tons 20,000 tons and we're at the, the the verge of seeing atlantic sapphire this year in 2020 um about to um commission a or harvest fish at a much bigger facility so we're at this kind of key inflection point in the industry uh, this is the first time we've done this database, but it is quite interesting to note that um, the um, Ernst & Young have done a study uh, for the last couple of years, and the database for projects um, going forward is, has grown substantially. So in their latest 2019 report, uh, they have identified almost a million tonnes of new capacity um, comparing with only about 350,000 tons. Uh, I think you've got Matt, problems sorry, with my screen, right? I yeah. interrupt you, Matt, but I think uh, if everyone looks at the screen as I do, it's a black screen. It's a black screen. Okay, I'm going to try and share again. One second. Okay, let's go back into this. Can everybody see that screen? Yes, that's better. Perfect. Okay, let's let's keep going. So the the RAS movement is not just about these grow out um, plants, but also RAS uh, used by the top salmon companies. And virtually every single top salmon company in the world, or the the leading salmon farmers, are using this technology to improve their farming. So in the past, they they started. I think we in Chile, where, where I'm based, uh, plants were starting to grow use RAS technology to grow slightly bigger smolt, but mainly because Chile had a constraint of fresh water. But now what we're seeing is is companies building plants that are capable of producing much larger smolts, and this is one of the the, the main ways that these companies are actually 
um, improving health metrics. So fish that are more robust um, for sea lice, and and they can, I think, in the case of Norway as well, they can actually speed up uh, the the sea pen cycles and produce more over time. So uh, we've seen um, recently that Agfa Group said that RAS will be the fastest growing area of, of aquaculture. Um, just curious to know if everybody can still see my screen, okay? Yes. Perfect, okay. So in our database, we've identified uh, which of the technology companies are at the forefront of this movement. And um, what, what I can say is that there are a small group of companies that are doing really well at the moment because they're, they're exposed not just to the grow out um, industry with these new grow out projects, but also building huge smalt farms as well for the uh, traditional salmon farming companies. So um, Billund Aquaculture of Denmark has been a very strong uh, performer in this space and, and built most of the earliest plants in Chile. But we've seen Aquamouth of, of Israel take a very uh, prominent position in this market. And they're the technology partner of um, Pure Salmon as well. So we'll hear from Martin a little bit about them. Aqua Group of Norway are very strong and Violia through its Norwegian unit Kruger Kaldness is very strong as well. And we're seeing new groups emerge um, because this is such a profitable business. So we're seeing Scale AQ um, come in. They bought uh, the Aqua Optima technology and they've, they've won a couple of big contracts. Um, at Arctic Aqua and Innovacy as well as started to um, get involved in the salmon business in the Americas. So the, the key, this is a really key year because we've seen to date that uh, the, the top grow out um, salmon farming companies have achieved harvests of about 1000 tons a year. And, and this is a, a real breakout year with Atlantic Sapphire. The, uh, the first generation of fish that Atlantic Sapphire are farming are, are on course for harvesting Q3. And they would actually produce 5,000 tons in 2020, according to their uh, latest investor presentation, and a lot more in years going forward. But also we're seeing other plants as well um, commission new facilities, uh, such as um, Nordic Aqua Farms in Norway. So really, these are the forces of change in the salmon industry. Um, you know, we've seen over the last few years how supply is quite constrained and um, it, it's been unable to move beyond the traditional fjord areas of Norway and Chile. Um, but we're seeing offshore farming with uh, Norwegian companies uh, building these amazing designs through development licenses. But we're seeing RAS behind RAS technology, uh, behind uh, much of the innovation. So in the traditional salmon farming industry, as I spoke about, and also with these new projects. And, and just one element that I'll go into in a bit more detail is this sudden um, flurry of projects we've seen with using flow through technology, but I'll, I'll get to that. So just through COVID-19, uh, we've seen a continuing flow of deals and activity in this sector. Salmon Evolution is starting a new um, salmon farm in Norway and Fjord just listed on the Oslo Exchange after a successful private placement. Um, and uh, we, we saw the big deal for the, the Japanese conglomerates coming in for Danish salmon, which is one of the most um, mature uh, projects to date and, and, and have produced many generations of fish. Atlantic Sapphire, securing more finance, etc. I thought I'd just really, before we get to Q&A, just mention this um, sudden uh, emergence of these flow-through projects in Norway. And um, I, I kind of think of it like at Norway reinventing the wheel, but it's using, it's kind of, a, a lot of the entrepreneurs behind these projects have talked about combining the best of both worlds. So you by by growing salmon right next to the coast and in closed containment facilities you solve the sea lice problem um you solve the escape problem but at the same time you don't have quite as much of the risk that you get with the ras projects and our database reveals that there are eight projects 
that um, envision more than 250,000 tons a year of new capacity. So in the coming days, we will um, be announcing and promoting the handbook, which we have almost finished. And um, it's got a very comprehensive database of these projects um, and some insights into that data. So it's, it's really a data-driven publication. And thanks for listening. And so I will now go back to the panel and um, we'll, we'll get into Q&A. Um, so I will start with a couple of questions of my own and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll move into the chat. We'll, we'll, we'll take questions from the outside audience. So um, I'll start with Martin. Mar Martin, um, you have a, a fascinating uh, background by having um, uh, secured financing for this new generation of um, of grow out projects around the world and i was just keen to, to hear from you on the you know the challenge of making this a reality um and, and maybe a little bit about how soon pure salmon will be um uh, starting construction of its facilities sure um so uh yeah you're quite right we just we just uh in february uh finished a, a large asset raise for pure salmon so we raised uh, nearly $360 million of equity. Um, and that's for our first three projects, which are in Japan, France, and the US, which is a total production of 40,000 tons. Uh, that's 10 in France, uh, 10 in Japan, and 20 in the US. Um, but yeah, the raise was quite interesting, actually, and we, we have had a, a extremely prestigious investor base for this for this project including uh, sovereign wealth funds, insurance, uh, pension corporates, large, large family offices, which I think in itself serves as a, not just a, a vote of confidence for, for, for pure salmon, of course, but also for the industry um, and, and where it's headed. And, and there's no doubt we've also had a significant amount of um, investigation and due diligence by these investors and their consultants into to what we're doing, uh, you know, the topics around scaling up, as you mentioned um, earlier on, mo most of the facilities out there are smaller and we're one of the companies uh, taking it to that next scalable level. So I think that in itself is a is a critical is a critical topic. Um, so in terms of where we are with these with these various projects. So firstly, um, as many people know, we have a proof of concept facility already um which is which is in poland it's a growing market size fish it has been for the for the last year or so so we're now going into that uh that scale up process so our first three projects are at different stages um in their in their life cycle they're they're um all um pre-construction at the moment so we're going through various steps of uh, permitting and engaging the construction companies and consultants, but it's a very, very progressed um, situation. And we will start building uh, these facilities uh, later this year, um, starting with Japan uh, first. And that's that's the first in our in our series of um, of projects. And then just so Martin, I'd be keen just to do a quick follow up question. Um, mm. You know, we, we spoke a little bit before um, this 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 uh, this webinar, but um, how difficult is the deployment of resources to get to have three projects on the go at the same time? Uh, because we've seen that, you know, it's been quite a challenging experience uh, for some companies in the past to make this happen. Yeah, no, I think I think recruitment and experienced staff around the entire uh, land-based business is a is a critical topic and, and it's something that we've focused on very specifically so to, to give you an, an example around the production side we have set up um, the pure salmon academy and its sole focus is to to take people and train them um, from a, a practical perspective as, as well as a theoretical perspective in how to farm land-based, how to use the specific technology that we have. Um, and that, that's a program that's being set up now, well ahead 
of when we're going to have our first large scale projects in place. So I think that gives gives everybody a sense of 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 how important we feel uh, staffing is and and experienced staffing. Um, you, you also touched a bit there on construction, um, and and in some senses, you know, we are a construction company um, at the moment as we're going through this build. And as you quite rightly pointed out, we're we're building um, on on in different countries. So that's something else that we're putting a lot of resource into. And we've made some very senior hires on the construction side, and we continue to do so. So that's in areas such as construction management, uh, contracting, procurement. Uh, and those hires are being made at the, uh, we, we have a sort of central pure salmon management company that's um, based in Abu Dhabi. So we're hiring people into that central group, but also hiring construction people um, on the ground uh, on the local facilities as well. So we're approaching it um, from uh, from multiple angles. Great, thanks, Martin. So I, I thought I'd just go around the panel and just um, approach the topic of, you know, brass becoming um, mainstream through the different areas of expertise. So I'd like to go to you, um, Brian. Um, I, I've, I've visited the Freshwater Institute a couple of years ago, and I, I know how much research you guys do on, and, and you're really at the cutting edge of this. Um, wh where do you think we are right now with the technology for, for land-based farming in salmon? I think the technology is uh, maturing enough to the point where uh, people can assess the risk and uh, and folks like Martin and Roy can um, can raise capital and uh, identify the risk to their potential investors and funders. Um, prior to the last couple of years, um, the technology uh, really was the same, but um, hadn't been proved out. Um, we, you know, of course, we've been doing this for a long time, uh, but only doing the land-based salmon portion for the last decade. And I don't think the technologies are, are shifting too much. So the same biofilters used 10 years ago as they are today. Um, but you're able to see how successful, how, how they prove out. So as Martin said, the Pure Salmon facility, I think, in Poland is, has been their proof of concept to, to essentially show people that they can do this, that the risk is manageable and can be mitigated through um, various means. And so I, I think that's where the technology is. It's the next step of technology is going forward. I think we're going to be uh, trying to assure that we can maximize the potential, biological potential of the fish through the technologies. And what I mean by that is you'll hear a lot of numbers and, and I'll throw Martin under the bus here and say, well, he's 40,000 tons, but um, there are certain assumptions that go into the 40,000 tons. And, and one of the main ones is assuming that the biological potential of the salmon is achieved. And uh, that is not always a given. Each cohort represents uh, a different group and has certain challenges. And uh, it's a multifactorial thing that goes into this. So, you know, we're, we're looking at some of the things that go into that. Of course, the genetics, what strain, and then things like temperature and, and photo period and water quality and all of those things um, are integrated into the biological performance of the salmon. And if you can only achieve 90% of the potential, I don't know if the business plan still works out, if the return on investment is as said. So we're, we're hoping to you know, go from the technology point here. Of course, we're looking at some new technologies uh, like uh, Alani is looking at with precision aquaculture and also ways to reduce water use through um, you know, high, highly, uh, highly efficient treatment processes like um, membrane bio biological reactors or anaerobic digestion. But that's where I think we are. Great. I think you might have already answered my next question, Brian. But um, when I when I visited the Freshwater Institute a couple of years ago, I, I remember that some of the main um, areas that you were working on at the time was was feed formulas that were specific to um, RAS plants and also the use of um, uh, triploid eggs. Where where is the Freshwater Institute deploying most of its efforts in twenty twenty? Yeah, on that's a great question. Matt, we uh, continue to do feed research. Most of our feed research is directly um, 
in in consultation and contract with the major salmon feed suppliers. So those are projects we work on directly with salmon feed suppliers, trying things out, whether it's um, a feed additive for improved fish health or fin health or um, a binder or something like that for improved uh, fecal stability in, uh, in RAS, which is really important. So we continue to do those projects on our main uh, USDA funded, which is a government funded project. Um, in 2020, we are looking at some of the um, factors that go into reducing um, uh, maturation of salmon to, as I said, make sure that they achieve their full maximum potential where you would have essentially none of the fish maturing early before harvest um, and they would have maximum growth. So that's really one of our big studies uh, on the salmon side. We actually have a genetic strain by environment uh, study going on for steelhead as well. So we're looking at, I think it's five or six different genetic strains of, of steelhead um, eggs, and uh, we'll be uh, running them in uh, recirculating systems to identify the best performing genetic strain uh, for steelhead producers. Great, thank you. I, I'm just going to stay with the technology um, elements of this discussion for a moment. And Eleni, I would I would really like to ask you about your involvement in this technology um, with Sintef. I, I understand that you're looking at the automation of these um, plants, and and you're working with a couple of cutting edge projects in Norway. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit to the that side of things and introducing automation mm -hmm. and robotics to this new technology. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, in uh, Sintefas, uh, we're working with a lot of risks and different fields. But in my group, we're working mostly, as you mentioned, with the automation and robotics and the new technologies for sea based and land based. But uh, for this webinar, I would like just to concentrate in one of the projects, like the AutoSmooth project. Uh, where actually the owner is uh, scale aquaculture and the two out of eight partners is Amfjord and Salmon and Salmon Evolution. So the goal of this uh, project is to see how we can make the next generation of the smart small facilities of the future. What we aim, we see that all these facilities increase in size they all want to develop different type of uh, uh, tanks, different type of recirculation water technologies, and uh, increase the fish that they will grow on the size, and to challenge some of the challenges they have, like with mortalities, sea lice. But uh, all our partners where they see that they can't deal with all these challenges without adapting automated solutions to have more uh, optimal uh, operations. So what we are uh, targeting there is to adapt sensors technologies that need to be installed on these facilities, which methods we need to develop in order to uh, have nice, uh, good data acquisition methods to collect high quality data which methods we need to use in order to analyze this data and give to the farmers uh, inputs on what are the conditions of the fish on these huge facilities, because we can't continue relying on the manual labor uh, operations and very subjective experience-based decisions. So all our partners here, they see that the the use of the new technologies and good assessments of the data can help them to optimize their production and make sure that we will have a, a better fish welfare, what are the water conditions, what are the environment, and which are the best decisions. So this is mainly our group in concentrating on the use of new technologies and how we can help the fish farming industry with the new robotic solutions and uh, the sensors and the data analysis to reach the new factories and uh, target the possible new challenges that might arise with all these new different facilities. 
Thanks, Eleni. Um, and actually, what, what I was keen to ask you was, so many of the, um, we, we've seen a lot of die-offs in smalt farms, you know, even by the big salmon farming companies and grow out plants. And it, it, it seems to be when there's a big die-off, it often seems to be the biofilter and the, you know, the poisoning of the fish through H2S. Is this an, is this an area which um, automation can bring solutions to? This is what we discuss a lot with our partners because uh, when uh, my understanding is that uh, RAS is targeting a lot of uh, challenges with uh, uh, this system. But when it comes to H2S, when you measure it, it's too late. This is at least our partners that are telling us. So when we're coming to this, if we can really have 24 7 monitoring and we can have data that can predict potential H2S development and show trends. And if we have automated factory that not only uh, knows what is the state, but can control of the water flow or other parameters, we can really uh, have uh, alarm systems and uh, give better monitoring. So predictive tools that could uh, be used with the automated solutions might be able to show new, new directions before we get sensors that can measure before it's too late, for instance, for H2S. And this comes not only for the H2S, but it comes for all the parameters, like uh, water level, water flow, and all these things that if we are able to automate these processes, we can have a better conditions and reduce the risks, both for the fish and for the people working in these huge facilities. Great, thanks very much. Roy, so um, finally, I, 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 I get to you and I wanted to, I think what I wanted to ask you was, I, I can definitely see some of the um, questions from the audience being, in your area of expertise, but I just wanted to, if you could walk us through the area of financing a major uh, project. I know this, you've just been involved in, in a major new land-based facility in uh, Sweden, and you've successfully just got Siemens on board to um, implement new technology. I, I just want, I, if you could give us a sense of how difficult it is to bring these groups together and to bring the financing elements into a major project. Yes, well, um, obviously we have seen a lot of cases during the past five, six years uh, in, in the area of RAS technology and land-based. We worked with several of them. Um, so the learning has been uh, quite good for us. Um, the challenge uh, uh, in a case like this has been addressed in, in the panel today and, and uh, Elaine also addressing the technology part, and obviously that's that's uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have uh, been able to uh, get Siemens uh, as a global player on their digital enterprise solution to go into the the Swedish case. Obviously, very important. Um, what what we have seen is probably one of the biggest challenges. Uh, in, in, in previously has been that there has been too many cases out there where um, too much focus on the RAS technology and too much focus on the potential of the business uh, in the market and uh, to, for us it's always been putting the cases together where we can de-risk as Mark can say uh, the in investors' um, understanding of entering in and supporting uh, cases like this. And the, the Swedish case is, is very different from any case we, we have in the market. It's actually uh, an invitation to five industry players that are specialists in each of the value in the park. That means we will have a farmer, we will have a processor, we will have a restaurant stuff producer and so on, and they are existing industry today. So, so that's how we have seen it. It is possible to put the new generation of an industry park together. 
Um, but when we look at the separate cases that we are approached with, um, it's very, it's very uh, different in which country and which part of the global area we are talking about. If you go to Norway, you can see the listed company this week. It's a knowledge uh, of the industry. Uh, but when we are talking about a similar case in China or uh, for that matter in in India, uh, it's it's a totally different ball game. And um, for us, it's it's all about building the case, um, understanding the technology. Obviously, we know all the players you're referring to. It's not a big secret that we are working close with some of them. Um, but it's also understanding what type of knowledge and people are behind the project, and uh, and we know Pure Sound them well. We think they are doing the right thing with putting up the academy and and uh, understanding how you need to put uh, skills and knowledge into the industry. And that that's when you have that package in place. We are being able to put the funding together by raising the money through. Uh, lending, financing the capex of the project, uh, but obviously it's always start with equity. So, Roy, I'm I'm going to put you on the spot here, and um, I you, you mentioned that you would work with a traditional farming company, um, or, or, or I, I was just I was wondering, is it one of the traditional salmon farming companies or one of the big? players that already use this technology because to my mind to date we haven't seen any of the traditional c pen companies get involved in a grow out project well yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. yeah no 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 that's fair that's fair well you can say from our view and we know all of them and have been working with them several times uh, i would say on the contrary that every one of them is well skilled and have a high level of knowledge of RAS technology since they have uh, been using RAS for smolt. Um, what we see nearly from every one of them is that they are developing their knowledge and their smolt to big smolt. Um, and I will say it's just a matter of time before you will see they also go for full grow out. Uh, but these guys know what they're doing. They understand uh, they really understand uh, what Brian is talking about when you're talking on, on biomass and genetic and, and challenges uh, of, of the biomass combined with technology, uh, genetic and feed and so on and so on. Um, so I would say we can see, if you look at Greek seafood, you can say that converting nearly every small facility to big small today and it, everyone knows about the new farmland project that's that's an aqua mob solution for big small um it's it's nothing different to for them to expand that to a grow out if they wanted to do it uh, so i think we will see them coming i know some of them is already looking out and uh, we know that some of them has already been visiting atlantic sapphire so <laughs> It's just a matter of time. <laughs> right. So we're going to get into our um, uh, questions from the audience. There's a lot of them. So uh, let's, um, yeah, maybe let's keep our answers brief and see if we can do as many as possible. Roy, I'm just, I'm working down the list. I'm going to stay with you because uh, one of the questions we had was RAS versus offshore. Um, very keen to get your sense of that question. I think you'd be a good one for that. Yeah, uh, we know about the offshore and we're working with some of the technology partners that are construction uh, partners on the offshore, um, not only for salmon, but in general. Uh, I believe that offshore will be uh, definitive the part of the, the farming uh, way of farming in the future, uh, as land-based and conventional will be. Um, Obviously, the, the ticket size for going offshore is, is it's, um, it's not for everyone to do that. Uh, but uh, the knowledge is, is uh, again, a key word. Uh, but the technology from offshore um, oil and gas is, uh, is copy-paste in that type of uh, technology. So uh, that it will work, definitely. Um, it will take some time. 
probably, uh, but it will be a part of the grow, growing volume of farming in the future. Quite sure of that. Perfect. Thanks very much. Right, I'm going to move on. And um, Martin, I'm going to ask you, uh, first of all, on uh, the costs at the moment. Where do we stand in terms of costs versus uh, traditional CPEN? Um, that's a question I think we've seen from two or three people. Uh, yeah. Um, firstly, if you just indulge me for one second, um, so I can cut because I got thrown under a truck politely earlier on. I just want to come back on that very quickly. I actually agree um, with, uh, with with Brian's comments um, about the scaling of these projects. And actually, for us, this is why our Polish Poland facility is so important because we can use our knowledge from that facility to know what's actually required. To, to get 10,000 tons of output from a facility. So it's not like we're, we're building a farm and hoping it gives us 10,000 tons. We're reverse engineering it back from 10,000 tons based on um, what we're doing in Poland. So that's actually an agreement with you, Brian. Um, so moving on to the costs versus traditional, and I've been looking at the questions that have been coming in from the audience as well, and there's questions about price points and and, and you know what level uh, price do you need to to be able to sell at to make land based profitable? So I think a really critical point to make here, um, and and Matt, you touched on it in your intro, is that this new generation of land based uh, salmon farms are large scale. Okay, they're large scale, so they can benefit from an economy of scale, and we can get the production cost down. Um, so it's not that, for example, pure salmon is expecting or needs to sell at a premium price over market price. We, we fully expect that we should be able to sell at a premium price, but that's a slightly different topic. We, we don't need to. So it's a case of chipping away at the cost of production to get it that bit lower than, um, than, than the open net pens through a variety of different uh, reasons, but also this really critical topic about moving your production to where your consumer is. Because of course that takes a significant amount of cost out, out of the equation. So if you're not flying uh, fresh uh, salmon halfway around the world, you're just trucking it for, for four hours. That totally changes the, the dynamic, probably more meaningfully than you know clipping a little bit of, of um, improved FCR or something like that. So I think that is a, a key part of, of the land-based story that sometimes gets a little bit forgotten. I mean, it's obviously much more relevant to those projects that are based near their consumers. And of course, that's not the model that everybody has, but a, but, but a number of people do. And certainly it's our model to be, to be located in the local communities. Right, and, and Martin as well. Also, just to address your, you know, your your earlier comment, um, uh, um, just the way that we perhaps frame the questions. But I, I'd like also to take it from a, a different perspective. I, I've spent a lot of time in the last week looking at the Atlantic Sapphire um, investor presentations. I think one of the key things that stuck out when I reread one of those is how they see their model de-risking as the volume goes up. So the, the, the more tanks you have in production, they kind of say, well, if we had a one-off um, event in one of our facilities, the bigger we are, the smaller percentage uh, we're affected by. I, I guess that's the, you, you have the same um, risk assessment. So, so look, we, we take a, a fairly unique approach to this, I think, um, in the sense that, that we are a global company and we have a global rollout. So... You know, our, our vision is to have 260,000 tonnes of production at multiple facilities around the world. Um, and it's been an, a stated objective of ours that they will either be 10 or 20,000 tonnes. And we think that's the sweet spot between um, economies of scale, but also not having too much risk at what, in one facility. Not, not just necessarily around production risk, but also around... Um, market penetration risk. We don't want to be a significant part of the sales of, of any one market or, or exposed to 
you know, other other conditions in a market. So, so I think there's a number of mechanisms at work, and certainly, for example, the modulization of facilities, so you know, breaking them up into effectively, you know, six or eight smaller uh, biosecure systems is the way, one of the ways to help manage that risk. Great, thanks very much. I'm going to keep moving uh, through the questions. Uh, there's there's been a couple of questions on the issue of sludge removal. I guess you know the the, the RAS um, industry and and land based in general, you know, has a lot of sustainability credentials. I'm going to uh, Brian. I'm going to give this one to you. And and I just wondered, um, you know, is is removing the, the, this issue of removing sludge is that one of the last areas of making the RAS argument uh, a sustainable one? Uh, thanks for the question, Matt. And and um, I think it is one of those questions that has been secondary because we're all been trying to get the technical and biological feasibility of growing the fish down. And now um, there have been, you know, traditional technologies used in terrestrial agriculture applied to um, aquaculture land-based facilities, things like, you know, sludge thickening and then land application of, of manure. So, um, you know, that, that I think has been a bit of a, a default um, for some of the larger land-based um, projects. Uh, but as the scale goes up, as we've been talking about scale, the volume of sludge uh, that comes out of these facilities is quite large because it's heavily uh, laden with water. And uh, those technologies that can reduce the sludge volume dramatically um, to provide something that is more manageable is something that uh, we see folks working on. Uh, we are working on that. Um, in the past, we've worked on you know, concentrating technologies, things like gravity settling or belt filtration um, to get to uh, essentially a 20% uh, solids manure. But um, now we're looking at uh, even more sustainable technologies like anaerobic digestion uh, that would reduce the volume of solids, you know, 90% while producing um, uh, methane or biomethane that can be used for, for energy recovery. So there's um, uh, some challenges there, both on the saltwater side um, in doing that. Uh, Dr. Yanni Uzo Hart, uh, University of Maryland, uh, is working on some saltwater anaerobic digestion with. Um, farm in Norway and that has worked well. We're working on, on the freshwater side, very similar to dairy waste digestion. And uh, there are some other technologies, you know, straight out drying uh, that have been um, promoted, um, have been used, but they're very energy intensive. Um, Matt, if you don't mind, I just want to reflect a little bit on what Martin said about um, uh, locating facilities close to market and it addresses one of the questions about uh, carbon footprint. We did study carbon footprint comparison between land-based and net pen and, and uh, with collaborators at Syntef, Lani. Um, uh, most of those folks are gone now. They <laughs> have moved on to, uh, to industry. But uh, what we found real quickly was that uh, at the farm gate, the carbon footprint uh, in RAS was about the same as it is in uh, open net pens. And, and the reason why is because feed is such a large component of uh, carbon footprint and um, RAS systems tend to have a uh, better feed conversion than the open net pens that uh, any of the additional energy that goes into the RAS is offset by that. So you end up with an equal, an equal carbon footprint at the farm gate. Um, and then it becomes transportation and that's what drives the rest of it. So as Martin said, if you, if you put fresh fillets uh, on a plane and fly them around the world, well, the carbon footprint will go very high as opposed to producing close to your market where you have very little uh, carbon footprint. Thank you. Great, thanks. We, we, we've got a lot of questions and, and we won't get through them all. There, I'm, I'm going to take some of the um, topics that we've had multiple questions on the same thing. Definitely, there's um, a lot of questions about pricing and I'm going to, um, uh, Roy, I think I'm going to get you to do that one. Um, what do you make of um, the, I guess, the prices that RAS farmers need to become profitable? Um, because there's a lot of, I think, a lot of premium prices built into the ROI model. If you could just go for that one. Yeah, well, if you look at what, 
when we started looking at it, it was insane cost uh, to, to, to get the money back from a RAS system. But uh, um, it, it's driven in two directions, actually. Uh, obviously, the technology and, and the knowledge has been driving uh, the, the forecast of the prices down. We have seen cases where the combination of where you put up your uh, facility is obviously going to have an impact on the total cost. Um, if you're going into a country where the, the, the poverty prices or ele electric prices is high, it's going to drive a cost up. If it's going to be a, a, a logistic issue to transport uh, or getting a feed to the site and, and all of that. So it's very sensible, uh, sensitive uh, when we look at it. And we have seen cases where they're talking about the cost below what we see in average the last year in the convention farming. And we have seen them being uh, 10 to 15, 20% below, beyond uh, the average cost of the convention farming in Norway. Um, I think that um, the price we have seen in the market for the, the salmon is, is obviously going up and down and, and the latest price in, in in uh, US for the salmon now is beyond the cost of producing in Norway. So there are some challenges here, uh, but the latest and the scalability is obviously going to have a huge impact. I mean, if you have a 10,000 ton and you will achieve 7,500, you will still make money. But if you have a 5,000 ton and you only do 4,500, you will never make money. And that type of calculation. Um, but everything is going the right way with uh, the cost of producing in the RAS. Uh, but it's not only the, the technology you need to focus on. You need to actually understand the total impact of having that facility where you put it. Not only transporting to the market, but, but cost of labor, knowledge of people, and logistic issues, and so on and so on. So. Uh, it's a, it's a big, big difference between the cases out there. Uh, uh, great. And just quickly, um, what do you make of the overall g global supply and demand fundamentals? Maybe a year ago, I, I heard lots of presentations from Rabobank, DND, <laughs> saying that there's a fundamental um, supply shortage in this industry and there's lots of space for the RAS farmers. But then, of course, this year, uh, COVID-19, we've seen the salmon price really drop. What's your view on that? Well, my, my view is still the same. I mean, uh, if, if we hadn't seen any drop in the salmon price under the COVID-19, I will be terrified, actually, because uh, it needs to react on the reality in the world. And it, it does. It goes down. But if you compare it to other industries, it survives very well. Uh, but my future view is that it's going to take five to ten years to see see some big volume coming in uh, beside the 2.6 million we see today. The reality is it, it, it will take time and, and in the next ten years, I don't see anything that can change the, the, the market situation and demand. It will be bigger demand than production at least for the next five to ten years. Great, thanks. Martin, I'm going to pose the same question to you. And then we've had several questions on um, taste of, of lamb-based salmon and, and just the, the, the branding segment as well. Lots of questions on that. But just first of all, your views on this um, topic of supply and demand pricing. Yeah, so um, uh, as, 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 as Roy said, we expect there will be you know some some uh, impact of of COVID, um, but I've you know I've been looking at the questions as well, talking about you know what do we uh, what what do we expect to see um, in terms of um, oversupply of of RAS product maybe in 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 certain markets, and I think the you know the fact is that the the that the market cannot the industry cannot meet the supply that that the market wants. Um, and I think all Raz is going to do is is help loosen that uh, part of the equation. Um, so, and, and of course, we're focusing very much on going to markets where we're going to be a relatively small proportion of of that market. So I don't think there's going to be a um, a significant impact there. Um, your other question was branding, yeah. 
Oh, you're on mute. I'm on mute. So, yeah. <laughs> so, my, yeah, my question is really, um, there's been a few questions, as you've probably seen on, on Taste. Yeah. And also, um, you know, just the branding question. I might, I might frame it in a different way. We've seen, yeah. for example, Moe try to go beyond a you know salmon as a commodity and go for a brand i mean how, how how will you go about that okay so um so pure salmon will be a brand so 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 the the intention is that we will have branded product uh because we believe the market is ready for branded product uh, not just white label and that is going to help us uh, get a premium product but it's also going to help around the messaging because one of the topics in the industry is how do you convey to the public what, what they're buying when they're buying a lamb-based product? And the, the easiest way to do that is around uh, brand identity and what it means to be buying a certain, a certain brand. So that's the strategy. But also, um, I know I keep coming back to this, this local for local story, but it's also very important for branding because, of course, you know, if we look at our, our French project we we have a a made in france product same for the us we can put the made in the usa stamp on it and and we shouldn't underestimate how important that is in certain markets it's also uh, i think become increasingly important because of covid because there is of course a lot more focus now on traceability of product where has it come from where's it traveled where's it traveled from so I think branding is a really interesting topic and I could spend the next half hour talking about it and I can see we've got about four minutes left. So, so I'll stop there. Um, quickly on, on, on the taste. I mean, the, the taste, I mean, I, I've, I've tried obviously a lot of our um, salmon and also other people's lamb-based salmon and we've had a significant number of experts, people from the industry, Michelin star chefs, uh, obviously our buyers, doing you know, endless taste tests and biological tests on our on our fish. And the feedback is is really, really strong. There are processes you can go through to, you know, manage any off tastes and, and so forth. And I think you know, the industry has really matured um, in with res in not just in the actual RAS part, but with, with respect to dealing with some of those issues. And of course, there's a lot of research going on and, and you know, Brian and his colleagues and look at all these topics and and we work with a lot of external parties as well to work on all these topics but feedback has been really good and we're very very pleased with the product great thank you um eleni i've um i i've been keen to get back to you and um i'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here because i know that you are working with a couple of companies on a technology basis but um Two of the companies that you were working with have really been in the spotlight in the last couple of weeks in the industry, uh, Salmon Evolution and Anfjord, that are bringing these flow-through systems and, and, and getting finance for them. And um, they could add to the you know, Norwegian supply of salmon. What, what's your sense of how these projects are, uh, you know, are, are, they, are they going to be successful? Um, uh, that's my question for you. Uh, my personal view, uh, we're working very closely with Amfjord and Salmon Evolution and we're having almost every month meetings and we're having close follow-up on their development and the uh, inputs exchange on the technology and uh, yeah, use of automation. So, of course, I believe that they there will be success because what I see from the companies is that they are developing these new concepts, but they are innovating also on the adapted so, uh, new methods, uh, like uh, putting a lot of sensors, robotic systems, to make sure to address all the potential challenges with the, these new uh, facilities that they are developing. So, for instance, Amfjord is uh, innovating on putting a robotic system on cleaning their facilities. It, before even the facility is finalized, they, they are really looking in front to target the challenges before they are coming. So, Salmon Evolution has put a lot of effort on the biology side. So, how new technologies can be used in order to get 
better inside with respect to welfare. Uh, so I believe that uh, these companies are uh, putting a lot of uh, investment and uh, effort and using new technologies and uh, to produce fish and be increase their value. And uh, yeah, that is my experience and I really believe on that. But I am a technologist, so by seeing companies investing on that direction, I see that there are less risks when it comes to the operations to be sustainable. Right, um, and, um, and and you talked about the manual labor and taking manual labor out of these plants and making them automated. Would that really make a difference for the cost of these projects? Do you think? Because that's at the end of the day when we, you know, these people are talking about the pricing. But at the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to the operating costs, right? Yeah. So uh, one thing is that uh, we see that all these uh, fish farmers, they see the trend on, of course, using these technologies. And the goal is to decrease uh, the price, right? And increase their production. So, but they are a bit uh, um, not that keen on using this uh, technology because the use of all these sensors and the new robots increase the uh, money, that the price they need to put on their new production. But uh, when we will automate, as you say, all these parts and we have more objective decisions, with the new robotic system, more automized decisions and stuff like that, then I think that we can really reduce uh, the costs by reducing, uh, and not only by reducing the people working there, but uh, preventing potential uh, uh, losses that they can have if they are mainly based on experienced uh, decisions human beings can make mistakes and when the facilities are increasing such huge volumes the automation can help to reduce the costs when it comes to losses and things like that great thank you i've got one question uh, on i one one of the questions that that caught my attention was how do you get um, projects financed in other continents? So for example, Asia. Um, Roy, I'm gonna give that one to you, but I might go to Martin as well, as I know that you've, you know, you're planning projects in that, that region. So, yeah, so just understanding the question is how we fund differently in different countries or was it Asia specific? Let, let, let me uh, frame it in a different way. I mean, we've seen so many of the projects to date that have been backed by um, Nordic Finance or, or, you know, Nordic Aquafarms, Atlantic Sapphire. I think Martin's really sort of, you know, stress um, tested that theory. But, um, you know, Asia is such a huge market for salmon right now. And do you, do you see some of the major lenders, major investors getting involved in this space? Yeah, yeah, definitely. What we see, obviously, also, uh, it's it's driven by some quite big industry takers also uh, that want to go into the industry, developing their their existing and adding more in in different ways. Um, so, if you look at Asia and we just look at China, you have uh, around uh, 10 to 15 uh, ROS uh, projects going on with the industry players. Obviously, that that is creating a lot of uh, um, activity in the in the financing sector, and the bank is slowly getting on. Obviously, not leading that but they are interesting we see a lot of attention around the big uh, financing institution funds and and pension fund is looking into this and 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 obviously uh, this attracts more capital in um in total so um and and one of the big uh, difference we see in asia generally but especially in china is that the government is very supportive and uh, municipality level can actually go in and support establishment because they want to have the industry there 
and that's that's also one of the probably well developed solution we see and haven't seen other places is actually where the government and and uh, municipality is stepping up and, and supporting the financing part of the establishment great thank you i uh, just just a quick announcement we've gone over the hour um we'll go for another 10 minutes and then we'll wrap it at 11 15 eastern time um Martin, I want to give the same question to you. Um, I think your investor base is very global and not that, you know, concentration of Nordic investors that we've seen um, in some of the other projects. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we don't have Norwegian investors. And in fact, interestingly, uh, a very large uh, proportion of our capital came from Asia. Um and, and of course, one of our you know one of our projects, our, our early projects, is in is in uh, is in Japan. But we have a, a very a geographically diversified investor base, and and I would say, apart from a couple of exceptions, probably sort of non traditional investor base with respect to to people that normally invest in, in aquaculture. Um, I think also you know as the, as the topic is is Asia, it's probably worth touching on the fact that our our next project, um, uh, two of our next projects actually are in Asia, um, but the, the big one for us is in China, uh, where we're, we're just actually starting the equity raise now to build 100,000 tonnes of production in China across five 20,000 tonne facilities. Um, and it, it's a critical market for salmon. It, it, it makes so much sense to be located in China to service that huge and growing market. Um, and just as Roy said, there's a significant level of governmental support in China for aquaculture and specifically for RAS. And of course that's filtering down to the, to the local governments who are supporting us um, at all sorts of levels um, in terms of you know, uh, helping to sell fish, looking for um, land and, and, and many other assistances. So it's a, it's a really, Asia is really critical for, for land-based in terms of deployment of facilities, but also in terms of uh, finding investors who are interested in and, and willing to invest in, 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 in land-based in general, but also land-based in Asia. Sure. And, and, and really, I, I think, you know, myself and Tom Seaman at Undercurrent News, we've, you know, we, we've spent the last couple of years going to the major industry conference in China in October. And I've also spent time in South Korea. You really see the, the Atlantic salmon um, trend taking off there in such a big way. Um, it, do you think your investor base uh, for future Chinese projects would be... Um, would be Chinese investors. Have you have you had any uh, talk so far? Mm. So 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 it's uh, it's going to be a broad mixture actually of, of of local China investors, and there's a significant amount of interest in that. But also, you know, a global investor base from um, the rest of Asia um, and and from from Europe and, and the US. So a global a global. Uh, investor base and and you know so China is is such an interesting market. It's already you know one of the larger um, consumers of salmon, but its per capita consumption is absolutely tiny. So a little move on the dial of per consumption um, is uh, per capita consumption is going to push overall consumption in China absolutely through the roof. And that's why it's such a big topic for everybody, for the exporters, but also for people like us that can actually go on, 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 yeah, on um, go, go to, to China and build uh, in the country itself. That's um, fascinating. Thanks very much. I, I just, um, you know, we've probably got time for one more question or maybe two, probably one. We've just had so many questions on the taste thing. I'm going to get Brian to answer that question as well, um, because I, I've seen several questions on the same topic. Yeah. So what do you Thank, think of that? Thanks, Matt. Um, and Martin has... Um talked about their very positive experiences um, with their product from the facility in Poland. 
we have had similar positive experiences here with our taste testing with various chefs in, uh, around the U.S. I will say, though, that this is one of those areas that is a risk for land-based um, the development of off-flavor compounds seems to be inherent with uh, the, um, you know, the, the biological um, uh, organisms within the RAS and the biofilter and the slime that grows on things. And that those off-flavor compounds, geosmin and, and MIB, uh, end up in the fish. And, of course, we have looked at different ways to mitigate that, primarily through a depuration process, a, a five, six, seven day, depending on species, temperature, swim speed, uh, purging of uh, the gut and then the off-flavor compounds from the fish fillet itself. And um, we actually just did a, a neat economic study on this and looked at um, uh, blood loss, uh, head on gutted loss, and then product loss over uh, various time in purging. And, and what we saw was um, for larger salmon, these were seven kilo uh, salmon, uh, we were losing about 2% of uh, filet or body weight, uh, sa saleable body weight um, at six days. So uh, this is something that is an area for improvement if if uh, farms like Martin's Pure Salmon can harvest fish straight out of the tanks and go right to processing. They will uh, not incur essentially a 2% hit. If uh, in, in testing they just determine their purging time has to be longer, 10 days, then it's a 4% hit. So, so this is an important uh, thing to take care of and to mitigate and hopefully to optimize. Um, you know, everybody tastes differently. I'm sure Martin has gone through this with his taste testing um, and there are different levels of geosmin and MIB that people will, will taste as Bundy or, or, or not. But um, uh, when we have fillets analyzed, we know there's a certain level that we need to get beyond uh, or lower than. And f for our land-based salmon, um, uh, for all, for 10 years, it's really taken six days to mitigate that. Now, there are some... Uh, projects that have indicated that they can harvest straight from the tanks and i don't know what the magic sauce is um, of course there's some uh, intellectual property associated there but that is something that's very important because a consistent product that doesn't have off flavor um, is uh, is what the consumer wants and as soon as your buyers receive feedback on negative um, uh, negative results from from off flavor in the filet um, that will upset your apple cart quickly Thanks, Matt. Great, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna get in one more question. We've got three minutes, two minutes. Um, Roy, I have a, an interesting question. There's one that I, I, I saw on, on our list um, and it's, it's quite interesting who it's come from, but I, I'm not gonna tell everybody. <laughs> but um, uh, what strategies do financial investors have to exit RAS investments? It's quite interesting because obviously, you know, it, it speaks to the ROI model when, when or an MPV model. When do uh, projects become profitable, and and when can investors make money in the in the the, the entire cycle to develop a project? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that, that's uh, that's uh, well. If if we knew that, we would be all rich. Uh, I'm usually saying, but uh, uh, it's a challenge. Well, but. What we see in uh, different cases uh, and from three and a half to five years uh, window of uh, IRR. Um, obviously, uh, our knowledge and experience from the industry, uh, we are trying to at least uh, pour some cold water into that because uh, I, I don't think that you can actually go into uh, a case establishing a 10,000 ton facility and expect to get that money back after five years will be, uh, well, yeah, that will be exceptional. Um, so we, we see that, and in, in that sense, we can say that we don't see very many cases out there where it's, it's driven by the investor type. It's more the industry mindset we, we see. And uh, where the either are a combination with investors and the industry people, people. and in most of the cases uh, that we have been working on is obviously that type of uh, solution. The one who's 
strictly driven by uh, equity or investment house where they are looking at return on three and a half to five years, uh, we are usually not working with them. It's not possible. Right. That's great. Thanks very much. Okay, we're on 11.15 Eastern time. That's um, all we've got time for. I really um, appreciate the input of all of the panelists. I thought it was a great conversation. Um, so thanks so much for taking part. Um, and uh, yeah, just look out in the coming days as well for a publication of our, of our handbook on land-based farming. And um, you know, we've come up with some interesting numbers. So um, again, but thanks very much. I, I, I appreciate it so much. And um, it's, this, this will be available as a replay as well. Um, that that is a link that you can post and um, if you wanted to reach a greater audience although there's we, we, we've this has been uh, we've had a lot of people on the call so that's fantastic so thanks very much thanks for that bye okay. thank you thank you bye 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 bye